you don't know who these guys are, they had a Kickstarter campaign recently uh, for their casino RPG game, and they are kind of a local success story because they have made something with bleeding edge technology and are getting it out there to the world, and it's just really, really awesome. So I'm really happy to have these guys uh, come talk. So without any further ado, here's Goldfire Studios. <laughs> Um, I'm James, and this I'm is Luke. And uh, yeah, so we're both Fire Studios. We, uh, we actually work here in downtown. We've got an office a couple blocks over, and we make uh, web-based games with HTML5, so JavaScript, Node.js, things like that. Um, so we're going to give you sort of a general overview of game development with JavaScript, and feel free if you've got any more you know deeper questions to to cut us off and ask those questions. We'll be happy to. Uh, talk in more detail about uh, whatever you want to know about. So, okay, well that was sort of the overview of Goldfire Studios, but uh, basically Goldfire started in 2008 um, when I was going to OU, um, and then we participated in the Venture Sport program here um, in this building. Uh, like I said, now we're working out of downtown. There's three of us working on this full time, um, and we're hoping to expand throughout the rest of the year. Um, so we'll be launching our new game in about a month. Um, so, that new game is uh, Casino RPG. Um, we did just do a Kickstarter on it. It, it finished up successfully, uh, barely successfully, um, about two weeks ago. And so, this is what it looks like right now. And uh, this is all running in the browser. This is on Canvas. Uh, it's real time multiplayer through uh, WebSockets. And basically, the general idea is you start in the game. As a janitor, as, you know, um, and you work your way up through role-playing type uh, features like missions, doing jobs, things of that nature. And eventually, you can uh, own your own casino. So you've got the you know, the tycoon aspect there, um, and you can of course play gambling games, also like slots and poker. Um, and so that's all um, again right in the browser, which we think is pretty cool. So we're, we're targeting uh, desktops and tablets with this. So uh, I'm just going to show sort of our trailer that'll work here, um, give you a better idea what it looks like. And keep in mind, this footage is about two and a half months old. Yeah, feel free to ask as many questions you want into. This is just uh, real and brief the stack we're using. Obviously, JavaScript uh, on the front end since we're using HTML5 and Canvas. On the back end, we're using Node.js, and that is great. Very easy to be able to use the same code you use on the front end to the back end, and kind of have the same simulation if you're writing one on the front end, the back end, and just use the code on both. Uh, HTML5 using the Canvas. Uh, uh, everything that you saw there from you need a DOM for UI or anything. So as soon as you go full screen, it's as if you're playing just a desktop game. And for a database, we're using MongoDB. We're with a NoSQL solution and a non-relational database because that structure fits games perfectly. A lot of the time you're saving state data, you're just saving the state of the game. And the structure of that data can change at any time. It's also very great for uh, rapid development because the same reason, your data structure is changing constantly. And so you don't have a strict database form that you're adhering to. It allows for the much easier, much more rapid development. 
And, and so, so we're 100% JavaScript. Um, that was really the idea to streamline the stack. Um, because if you haven't used MongoDB, it's just JSON. And it all works really well together. Um, so the engine we are using is, uh, it's called the Isogenic Engine. It's made by a company in the UK called uh, Relian Software. Um, and so we've been working closely with them since last summer. The engine is still, I guess it, technically it just hit 1.1 stable um, a few weeks ago. So uh, we've been closely developing the game alongside the engine. And um, uh, it's a pretty cool engine. You can check it out at, uh, I believe it's isogenicengine.com. They've got a free version you can download. So it's not open source, although they're in talks with uh, Mozilla right now, possibly open source it through them. Um, but uh, there is, again, the free version is available, which gives you all the features except for the uh, multiplayer aspect. Uh, so it's really easy to get on there, download it, and start playing around with it. Uh, and then the license, I believe, is 2% uh, revenues if you want the, the full thing. Um, so really, the reason, uh, there's a lot of um, HTML5 JavaScript game engines out there. I don't know how many of you have sort of played around with those. There's, you know, Impact, um, a bunch of other ones. But uh, really the reason we went with Isogenic Engine and, and the thing that really sets this one apart is um, again, it's in the canvas and it does isometric. Um, it also does 2D, but the isometric is really the, the magic. It's got um, pretty much all the other engines out there right now just do 2D. Even a lot of the new WebGL um, game engines are just 2D. And we wanted to do um, an isometric viewpoint. Your same simulate run in the code. That same code will run right on the server, um, which makes doing those um, uh, server side operations a lot easier. And then uh, it's also got full multiplayer uh, support built in. So we do the multiplayer through WebSockets. And um, it's got options for Socket IO, uh, but they've also built their own. It's called Net.io, which I believe is open source. And the advantage with Net.io. Uh, Socket.io is really nice, but it's sort of bulky. Um, so Net.io really streamlines it and makes um, the, the data being passed between uh, very slim, very uh, cuts out a lot of the headers and things like that. Um, so again, yeah, rapid development. The engine is undergoing rapid development right now. Um, it's, it's pretty much full featured at this point. Uh, there's a few things that are missing that I'll talk about shortly. Um, but again, if uh, if you're interested in game development, I strongly suggest checking out this engine. And uh, let's see, the other engines, I, I think you've... Uh, I played around a little bit impact. around with uh, Impact. Impact <laughs> is much more of a lightweight. I mean, it's professional, but it's very lightweight. Isogenic is very feature-heavy, very delayed, <coughs> so you uh, have a much more professional engine at your disposal. Also, with Impact, there's none of the back-end support. Isogenic engine, uh, it, integrate seamlessly with the client side and its server side. So with Impact, you're going to have to write your own uh, uh, server side or find something else. Yeah, and there's actually, over the last few months, we've seen more and more uh, engines popping up. So there are a few new ones that are in early uh, development right now that have isometric view also. Uh, one I saw earlier this morning, actually, I think it was called the Sheet Engine. Um, it's got some pretty cool features. It's, um, it's got real-time uh, shadows built in. Something I hope uh, the isogenic engine gets, um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot going on in this space. Mainly, one of the big things we're still missing is tools to um, more easily develop with HTML5 games. But I definitely say it's advancing. Um, so yeah, one of one of the areas that's missing still that's being worked on with the uh, isogenic engine specifically is audio on it. Um, I always hear this is an extreme pain point for games in the browser. Uh, so Isogenic Engine suggests using a library called Sound Manager 2, um, which companies like SoundCloud use. Problem, there's a few problems with Sound Manager. The well, main one is that it uses Flash as a callback. Uh, we don't use Flash. So the other one is it's only 
that only uses HTML5 audio element. Um, and HTML5 audio element is really easy to use, and it's got some nice features, but it's it's pretty slow. It's not you don't have persistent control over it. You can't uh, add filters and effects and um, different things of that nature. So that's where uh, Web Audio API comes in, which is uh, in about the last year Google has developed this, and it's now integrated into um, all the WebKit browsers, a lot of the mobile browsers now. Um, it'll be coming to Firefox in the near future, um, and uh, who knows when it'll come to Internet Explorer. But um, so we, you know, we needed high quality audio for our game. And we went out and looked at a lot of different libraries that are out there. Most of them don't implement Web Audio API at all. Um, and the ones that do that don't have any fallbacks. So we decided to write our own. Um, and we open sourced it about three weeks ago. It's called Howler.js. Um, and basically what Howler.js does is it defaults to Web Audio API. Um, it gives us that fine green control over the audio playback um, and builds in a lot of um, handy features like automatic, uh, an automatic cache pool for the sound files. Um, of course, the you know play, pause, fade in, fade out, um, things of that nature. Uh, one of the cool things we built in is audio sprites, so you can define sort of segments of the audio file, and then uh, attach a name to those, sort of like you would with CSS sprites, uh, with a with an image sprite, and play back those uh, pieces of the audio without having to load lots of different audio files. Um, so let's see. Um, this I don't know if you can see this very well, but this is um, the code for Web Audio API, basic um, playback for Web Audio API. So HTML5 audio element again is great and it's very simple, um, but we want the performance of Web Audio API. Unfortunately, with that advanced functionality, the API is a little a little bit more tricky. Um, but essentially what it's doing here is it, uh, it's doing an XHR request to uh, download the audio data. And then with that data, you can uh, um, apply you know, different effects, uh, speed it up, slow it down, uh, a lot of different advanced features. You decode that into a buffer, load it into the audio node, which then hooks into the speaker as the output. Um, what we've done with Howler is we've abstracted all that away, added the HTML5 audio fallback and all those other features. Um, and so if you want to play a sound, you just define it like that. It does everything behind the scenes and then sound.play and, and your sound uh, is off and running. If you want to actually uh, pull up some of the examples here, maybe. Um, So, uh, for example, the sprites that I was talking about, uh, which is pretty handy for not just games, also um, just general interfaces. If you want to have button clicks, different things like that, you generally don't want to have a lot of different sounds. Um, so, basically, the sprite gets defined right here. You put a name on it, and um, the millisecond time, uh, the, the start, and then the duration of that sound. And so, you can just play the different sounds right away. That um, which with HTML5 audio element it works, but it's um, it's quite a bit slower. So the laser blasts would not overlap like that and things of that nature. Um, do you use what? Do you use oh, um, no. So it'll Howler will support any pretty much any. Um, audio codec that uh, the browsers support. Generally, to get full browser support, you need to use um, both uh, MP3 and OGG, um, because I believe it's Firefox doesn't support MP3 right now. Everything else supports MP3. Um, but so basically, the library will take the two sources that you provide, decide which one is best to use, and then only load that sound file. Um, if you're using HTML5 audio element directly, it's going to load both um, audio files regardless if the browser can play them. I'm talk about some of our oh, 
Got it. Um, so there's obviously some challenges um, developing for HTML5 games. It's obviously uh, very new. Like I said, there's not a lot of tools out there for it yet. Um, and so we've had to sort of navigate some areas that uh, might be uh, sort of easier with other platforms. Um, so scalability is obviously one. Um, and just, just raw performance drying on the canvas. Uh, you'd be surprised. I mean, there is hardware acceleration built into the canvas pretty much everywhere now. And um, on, on Casino RPG now, we're getting pretty steady uh, 60 frames per second. And then, uh, if you have a really good GPU, you can get up to like 200 frames per second. Yeah, yeah our artist gets like 200. Uh, and it's you know, artist really easy computer. But uh, on regular computers, yeah, I mean, it gets regular, you know, very smooth. Um, Animations. Um, you want to talk about some of the things you were um, on? One of the things, yeah, uh, performance wise, one of the big problems we have is uh, Firefox through Max <coughs> and uh, Linux. For reason, they don't yeah. support, what was it? They won't do hardware acceleration, they just right. do software. So you'll see, uh, you'll see a steady 60 in Chrome, and then it'll grind down to like 20 in Firefox. And I'm not sure why they made that kind of decision, but it's been a little bit of a development hassle. In the meantime, um, the image sizes and the GPU, the way the GPU handles images is a little tricky. So if you, hand, if you have too much Im image data, uh, if you just, just a few pixels over in the wrong uh, direction, then uh, your GPU will be, uh, you'll be using maybe 10% of your GPU. And in uh, your case, yeah. it'll suddenly uh, wave between 80% and 20%. So the, the big issue comes with animations. Um, so for example, um, when we have like people walking on the street, that's done with sprite sheets. So the full uh, pre-rendered, you know, walking animation of the of the player. And um, the problem is the GPU is having to swap out that image on each frame. Um, so as the image size gets bigger, even if it's um, the completely empty image, if there's um, you know it's just a transparent PNG, it still has to go through all that data. And you sort of just hit a point where it just drops off and um, you get no more performance. Um, so we've had to work around that sort of painfully by chopping up images. And for example, the character images, one character is, um, I think, 82 separate images, um, which would be nice to have it in one sprite. We've had to slice that into nine separate images for each character, um, make the GPU happy. Another area was with the, the buildings. So the buildings are pretty large images. Um, we need the sprite sheet from each angle. Um, and so we've had to do some tricky things with the, like the light animations on the buildings, cutting out um, the uh, empty space around those to, to uh, get the performance to work. Yeah. Um, how, many, uh, how many players per server are you guys expecting to be able to support? Um, yeah, so we're still working on that, but we're expecting concurrent. Um, it depends. So we're we're doing hosting in the cloud. Um, so it depends, you know, what size the instance is. But we think a, a small, the smallest instance, one CPU unit um, and a gig of, of RAM, should support about a thousand concurrent players. So it's it's fairly scalable, and, and you can scale up one one. Yeah. Well, we're on the subject. Um, is your client-server relationship more one of like that the client just simply displays what's going on in the server, like a remote desktop kind of thing, or is your architecture talking kind of about like an authoritative server? Yeah. yeah is, 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 are you running parallel simulations in the client and server, or are you just displaying Some, the server? Somewhat. So, um, one of the things like we were talking about with the more scalability you have, uh, if you're talking about there are kind of two ways to do it. Do it. Uh, one is to render in real time, where the server is constantly streaming data to the client on all positions of everything that's on stream. And the second way is to do where a lot of things, a lot of different uh, traditional RPGs and stuff do it, is every time a player moves, you just send a move request to the client, and the client simulates that move. And so you, since you don't have to constantly stream that entity data to the client side, you're actually removing a lot of the bandwidth. So what we're doing is to support scalability, is we're only streaming moves instead of streaming with constant And that allowed us to scale up a lot more than us. Right. Um, um, but the server does keep a state of 
where everything is at all times. Um, so you couldn't, you know, type into the console and move all the way to the other side of the map. Is there like some sort of authoritative push, like once a second or something, to keep the client sync, or do you not? So, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. That is something that's built into the, the engine that we could use. Um, but for this game, it's not really that necessary. Um, just because basically it's people walking around outside, never going to know if someone else is off by a couple of pixels or something. So, so we, we're just opting not to put that little analogy. Yeah, and I think one more answer to the question you're asking. We're trying to keep as much state data as possible in the database rather than being uh, just processed in the server. That way we can spin up as many instances as we need. As long as we're keeping that state data in the database, it can be replicated across all the time. Do you load all the assets to the browser? Yeah. No, so we've got a dynamic loader built in. Um, so, for example, with the characters, um, there's no way we could do it, obviously. there's Right now, we've got about 100 character customizations, which um, uh, renders out to about 101,000 images. Um, so those get dynamically loaded in. Some things get preloaded in um, that are, you know, the UI, uh, the tile set for the ground, things like that. Um, but other, other areas that don't need to get loaded in right away will get loaded in in the background. You have a mention that uh, you create state data so you can uh, you know, so will each server instance be an identical copy of the world, or will each server or server instance have it down? Now they all hook into the same thing. So they all Yeah, we would like to keep a persistent like rather than sharding the servers. Like, so how are you I guess how are you gonna deal with kind of growth of the world that's yeah? Yeah, there's so two ways. Um, one, we're going to, um, after launch, slowly start to roll out multiple cities, um, which are all part of the same game world, which you'll have to travel to those separate cities. Um, and two, the game world, um, so it's, it's again, city-based. It'll grow out automatically based on population. And then to keep things spread out, uh, well, there's two things. If for example, if a player doesn't log in for a month or two, their casino will get sold back to the bank, um, and then another new player can come in and take their spot. Um, and also, um, the uh, when players come into the game, they're not going to just go to the center of the map where um, everyone's been from the beginning. They'll be uh, more sort of intelligently placed around the game world so to match them with casinos. We sort of want them to go into. Come back in about 12 months, and I'm sure we'll be giving a presentation on the challenges. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> that'll, uh, so another uh, another thing with performance is is caching, which has been a big boost, and not well general browser browser caching as well, but specifically um, caching draws um, on an off DOM canvas. Uh, so drawing to an off DOM canvas is dramatically faster than drawing to the the main campus. So a lot of the um, highly graphical and CPU intensive things that we draw, we draw off, off screen, off DOM, um, render it there, cache it there, and then draw it onto the main campus. So it's kind of like you're swapping buffers. Like, like. Yeah. 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 We aren't uh, officially going to be supporting smartphones. Um, it's mainly going to be tablet and desktop. Um, now it will run on smartphones just fine, but you run into some issues with screen size. Um, and actually, interestingly enough, um, an iPhone actually gets a better uh, frame rate than an iPad just because it's rendering less data on the screen and it's. Um, but you know, you run into UI issues and things like that. But uh, yeah, I mean, generally the performance on mobile is is a lot better than you would expect, with with one exception. So we tried to do um, the uh, IDPI displays. Um, that's not ready to work with HTML5 yet. Um, basically, we got about two frames per second once we switched to that. 
but other than that, you know, it still looks pretty good. So, uh, do you have any comments on that? Okay. Uh, we'll be happy to answer any other questions. Let's, yeah, there we go. Questions. <laughs> How do you organize your code base? Um, so we actually use uh, um, see John Resig made like a sort of a class structure um, that the engine actually uses, and so we're following that. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I was about to say uh, since we've done a lot of it, we've done a lot of talking about that recently. Um, and that can cover an entire presentation on itself on how you organize the game and how you. Uh, Start everything. Basically, the client and server exists in separate classes, and that's where they divide. Um, it's not really, I, I can't really describe it unless it's showing it. Well, mainly, mainly to narrow it down more, like um, in terms of, so the game engine that we're working on is, uh, I'm not as familiar with JavaScript, but using the scripting language is similar to JavaScript. And you have to do like a new file, like run each file as a script. and um, what I found was that as the code base got bigger, um, keeping track of what file needs to launch, what other thing, bringing what resource became more difficult. So Are you using it. JavaScript to kind of like inheritance space for a Oh, well, it, uh, we're using a, a different language. It's uh, prototype based. Okay, it's prototype based. Do you, so you do use it? Uh, like, are you declaring prototypes and assigning, or are you using kind of like John Resig's uh, style? What, what I ended up doing um, for ours was uh, I had every file as wrapped in a method, which is kind of like wrapping in a function in JavaScript, mm -hmm. like uh, um, proper recommends. Yeah. So I ended up doing that. And so now all of our script things is a method. So when you execute the um, script, it doesn't actually run anything, it just creates a method. Because the method takes the um, takes arguments which are the protos that it takes in that script need. Um, and so that, that was how I, instead of having to say do file, do file, do file, and then pick stuff up afterwards, uh, I set it up to where when it initially loads, it just runs all the scripts, but all the scripts are just creating methods and the tendencies of the tendencies of each proto, like this one proto might arrive with another, uh, get passed in as arguments to them. Yeah, I think you basically described the exact problem. Oh, well, the inheritance structure, yes. <laughs> Yeah. I thought you were asking more about like how do you organize like yeah, a game classes. project? Yeah, there's a kind of a main that you won't get stuff. We have to add classes. Well, so, and so when we deploy it, we're not deploying all the different files. We've got a couple hundred different files. The deploy uh, script will take all the files, combine them into one, minify it, um, and so there's just one game.js to get served to the client. Um, <laughs> it's Getting bigger. It's about 600k right now, um, so not not too bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the the rest of the assets, though, um, we obviously don't load all these in, but with all the character images and everything, it's about uh, two gigs. Um, but generally, when we load the game in, you'll only be loading uh, four or five megs. Of um, so yeah, this is the current build of the game. Um, Do what? Yeah, so we've got sort of the basic version of the NPCs right now. You see a bug right there, but uh, um, so right now the NPCs are just sort of stupid and they just walk around from between, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, by the time, well, at some point, they will be going into the casinos, and uh, that's sort of what uh, Luke's working on right now. Yeah, there's a ty there's a tycoon simulation running behind it all. When you own a casino, it depends on a whole lot of factors that are running the casino. <laughs> and what we're going to do is there's going to be a simulation that's going to be running on the server. And we're going to be pushing different um, different things to the simulate from the simulation to the client, and the AI is just going to kind of act it out. So it's all running in the server, and all these AIs right now, all the AIs are running in the client, but the uh, future goal is to have them all running on the server. So every player will be saying the same thing. And so like if AIs might get in a fight or win a jackpot, and you think so. 
Yeah, yeah, that's actually uh, that's a good example of the uh, canvas caching that he was talking about. Yeah. When you load up the game, it takes all the texture data, draws the map on another canvas, <laughs> and then it just cuts out where you're at. So if you play like four hours, how the memory of the browser instead of this goes, is it just like find Firefox to see what we Depends on how well the JavaScript garbage like works. All the entities when you move, like when you go into a casino, the entire world map, all the AIs and everything are cleaned up to it. All the references to are more right? Where the garbage collector runs, it should clear up all those uh, blocks. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure we've got some issues with that at the moment, but um, we'll be heavily optimizing on that as we get closer to the data. The uh, modern JavaScript garbage collectors not pause or the other problems? Um, so now they used to be really bad at that, but uh, we haven't had any issues at this point. Uh, it's any, any pauses or lags from that. And we don't have anybody playing four or five hours again, so you might see that. But I mean, the great thing about the JavaScript game is to reset. All you got to do is control R, refresh the browser, and you're back. Do you have any questions about the Firefox um, Yeah, so the Kickstarter was. Uh, um, a good learning experience. Um, it was it was a ton of work. So uh, I think we had six hours to go when we, re when we reached the goal. Um, <laughs> so, but um, yeah, I think uh, I think the main takeaway is you need to um, have you, you need to build some media connections before you launch the Kickstarter instead of after. Um, so you're not spending like a month emailing people and feeding people, um, but yeah, I mean it was it was definitely a good experience. I'm glad we did the Kickstarter, um, and it's uh, it's definitely gonna, it helped us just hire um, an art director, so that's exciting. If you promote on Reddit, you better be ready to just brush things off. Yeah, Reddit is evil when it comes to uh, oh, on, on Reddit. Yeah, did you ever see this farm bill? Yeah, yeah, we posted on Reddit and we got some pretty harsh. Uh, yeah, so the game's free. Um, so that's one thing that we've already launched as a, a game platform, and it's got, uh, you can see it here, it's got um, this uh, universal virtual currency built in called Gold. So players can just, so it's all microtransaction based. Um, Slash, there's a subscription, optional subscription element built in as well. Um, so they can go and buy the gold, spend it on things like, you know, they want a pirate costume for their character. Uh, and, uh, you know. Okay. Alright, last question. We are trying to avoid the no pressure, it needs to be a good one. <laughs> oh, and we have, we have stickers, by the way, if anyone. I'd like to actually also point out a couple of our interns in the back. Jason and Susan, the two of sitting in the chair right back there, there's a couple of interns from uh, so. uh, I also want to announce if, um, if any of you are interested in game development, um, we are starting up a, uh, a game developer meetup. First meeting will be next month at some point. Um, so you can check that out and get on the list at okgd.org.